work can be important to you and being committed to your work is one thing. Being consumed by your work is another. I I will say that over and over again, because what happens when work is everything, if that mattered, then there would not be the volumes and volumes of super insanely successful people that are like, oh, I'm telling you, success is not enough. Like, it's not like there isn't a million stories about this. I don't have to duplicate any of these, but it's also stepping back to recognize, again, what do you, what do you want your life to be? Like, what do you want for your work? What do you want for your relationships? Helping you create loyal customers and loyal employees all through the power of simplicity. This is the Simple Brand Podcast, now heard around the world, including Montreal, Canada. I'm your host, Matt Lyles, and this week I'm talking with Sarah Ross. Sarah is an international keynote speaker and the founder of the leadership research firm BrainAmped. She's transforming the future of work by using the power of brain science to amplify organizational vitality and by helping people work, lead, and succeed in healthy, high-performing, human-centric ways. And Sarah's now a best-selling author of Dear Work, Something Has to Change. Look, it's no secret. Too many leaders, too many professionals feel like they're stuck in a complicated work environment. And they feel like they're constantly running on fumes, overworked, underliving, and overwhelmed. Even if they feel like they love the work that they do, or at least used to. And if that's you, trust me, you're not the only one. Thankfully, Sarah has strategies to help you simplify all that. Sarah and I discuss her Dear Work lessons to help you boost your work vitality so you can stand out and bring your best, most energized self to your career and to your other important life areas all without burning out. So here it is. Here's my interview with Sarah Ross. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, congrats. Congrats on Dear Work. Something has to change. Yes. Thank you very much. (laughs) Because we all know something does have to change when it comes to work. So, Well, absolutely. Especially, you know, when we look at over the past few years and now the title just calls out the situation we've been facing. And, and I'm not one to usually jump into the nuances of book titles. But when I saw this title, it really stood out to me. So talk to me about how did you decide on it and say, this is it. That's the title right there. I'm so happy to hear you say that simply because it was one of my only non-negotiables when I wanted to publish this book. Oh, and wow. truly, it was one of those that I was like, it, this is the title I really need it to be. And there were people who wanted to talk me out of it. They're like, well, you know, that seems like a very strange title. I'm not. And I said, I think that inherently there'll be a part of people when they read that, whether they've ever written a letter to work or not. Most people haven't. For the record, the whole point is that I did actually write a letter to work, which I'll expand on. But I think there is something in that title that we have a relationship with work. And so this idea of like, dear work, something has to be different. I wrote a book for people who, who care about what they do, who want to make a meaningful contribution, but don't want to give everything away in the process. And, and work can feel very consuming. And coming off the last couple of years, that's even more so. But the title, the actual title was something that didn't come about until I was about halfway through the first draft. I knew what it was going to be grounded in, but the letter element wasn't there. And the book genuinely starts with a letter to work. And I was explaining the book and the concept to a friend. And he said to me, he was like, well, why don't you actually base it on that letter? Like that letter is a letter that many of us have written in our heads as we commute home, as we have sat in those home office, as we've reflected on a Sunday night, thinking about a Monday. And I, so I threw it out there to um, my book coach that was kind of helping me frame things up. And she said, go for it. And that was it. And I just, I decided to keep it based on this idea of 
this is a professional love letter to work. Well, when I read that and when I've read and heard your story about writing the letter, that made me pause and stop and think, wow, I've been thinking about work wrong the entire time for, well, for my whole career of however long that's been. But a lot of times we think of work as maybe our purpose or our calling or our passion. Sometimes it's just it's just something that we do and something that we go to. But I've never thought about it like a relationship. Yeah. And that that's just so powerful to me in flipping that script, rethinking of it like a relationship. So how can that help us? How can thinking of work like a relationship help us in our work? Oh, it's a, a wonderful. I'm so glad you picked up on that. And I think it's such a powerful question because there's two pieces of it. It is a relationship, meaning that there are two separate entities, just like any relationship we have with people. There's you and then there is another party. And those are two separate things. And we know even in our most important relationships, when people lose who they are and they am overly amesh, there's nothing beneficial there. Like they, a relationship is between two people. A relationship with work is us and the work that we do. And what I think is also important about thinking about it from that perspective is work also isn't a person. And I say this right at the beginning because I have been pulled into this. And in my work with coaching and researching people who love their work and or trying to work in different ways, we can feel like work should love us back. Like if we work hard enough, if we give to it, if we're loyal to it, yes, work is made up of people and we care about the people. Right. But I think sometimes we're waiting for work to make us feel worthy. We're waiting for work to say, hey, you've, you know, look at you. You've done enough. You can hey. take a break. This is your condition of enoughness. But work can't do that because it is not a person. So in order for work to change, the only way for that to occur is for us to change. And then we go and we change work. And so I just I think it's so important on both sides to think about it as two separate entities but you are the only person in that relationship. Wow. Okay. Okay. I, I can see it that way. And then just realizing, recognizing the fact that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis, work takes up the probably one of the most significant percentages of our time. And Absolutely. then you look at it across our entire life, the amount of hours that we put into work, into our career, that takes up a significant percentage as well. So it only makes sense to kind of think of it this way. You're spot on. I, I mean, and, and hence why we need healthy relationships. We know that a healthy relationship with individuals is huge into our well-being and our success and all of those different pieces. A healthy relationship with work fundamentally matters because the other side of it and, you know, when we're, We've all know what that feeling is like where we are just spinning our wheels in survival mode and we feel overwhelmed by it. I always say this is a book about helping people recognize that being committed to your work is powerful. Feeling consumed by your work is not the same thing. And understanding that boundary between those two becomes really important. But the fact is we spend 90,000 plus hours doing work. And so a part of this book was also, I recognize that there were so many people who were essentially wishing their weeks away, waiting for weekends. Yeah. And then they would get to the weekend and they'd miss out on most of their weekend, dreading the week and the work that was ahead of them. And I thought that, that can't be the way that we spend our lives. You don't have to bound out of bed every day, loving what you do, but you, we cannot settle for waking up every day, dreading it either. So we have to find a way to create this relationship that is serving to us, to our goals, to our relationships, and to our health. Well, and if you look at it, if you look at it that way, if you look at it like a relationship, then that feeling of really dreading what you're doing in the moment, and then when you're not doing it, dreading the next time that you have to do it, to me, I'd call that a toxic relationship. Absolutely. So why Absolutely. do you think... Why do you think so many people have a toxic relationship with their work today? Oh, I couldn't even figure the whole answer out in a book. So it's, it's such a great question because 
because it, it can be really unhealthy, like you said, in this negative way where it's like, I used to love you, but but I but I don't anymore. But I think it can kind of go another way that is can be equally deceiving, but unhelpful. So this is how I'm going to answer this question, because I think for many of us, our work is so important to us that it becomes enmeshed in who we are. And I am not the first person to say it is incredibly important for us to be able to separate those two. But equally, work can be the thing that fills us with joy and this sense of value and contribution and significance. But if work is the only relationship that we have, if work is the only thing that gives us that sense of fulfillment and significance and worthiness and importance, then that in itself is going to create an unhealthy relationship because because work is full of people. It's, you know, it's this relationship, but it's full of people and it is influenced by context and circumstances. And sometimes global pandemics hit and sometimes industries and recessions occur and people who are amazing at what they do are no longer getting the opportunity to do what they do. And so we equally, I think there is two parts. It's, It's recognizing that work doesn't have to be everything for us and work can't be everything for us, if that makes sense. And so I think that those two things can be really important, which is why when I wrote this book and this idea of our relationship to work, it had to come down to, at the core of it, is an energy issue, like how we're actually managing our energy at work and outside of our work. And it'd be great if all we needed to do was sleep a little bit more, move our body. And I am proponents and advocates of both of those. But unfortunately, those aren't enough in order to change the relationship with work. So we have to address some of the beliefs that we have around work, how we approach work, how we approach success and define that success, how we look at stress and work with it because it's a non-negotiable element of doing meaningful things. And then how do we also acknowledge that energy is this beautiful continuously renewable resource that can fuel us forward provided we take a moment to refuel it. And so kind of putting those three pieces together was my goal. And when we look at that, I think it helps us look at work as a part of what we do, but we can exclude life and relationships. Like they are all components of that. So part of how do we make a better relationship, not just focusing on work. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like any major area of your life, whether it's your work, it's your, it's your relationships with, you know, with, with your spouse, your loved ones, your family, um, your spiritual life, your hobbies, all those things. And I don't think that you can focus on just one of those without there being the detriment to the others. And I think that you can't ignore any of those without there being a detriment to any of the other areas. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I think what was really interesting, I got through most of uh, writing and researching much of this book and then the pandemic hit. And it was like, oh, well, work just went and changed. So I wonder how that's going to influence things. And I think, you know, as we moved into 2021, um, Adam Grant, great professor Ed Wharton, also, you know, New York York Times bestselling author on one of my favorite books, Rethink and Give and Take. But he highlighted the research of Corey Keyes around this feeling of languishing. And this was, I think, such an important thing for us to start to to appreciate. Languishing is a sense of of blahness. And I, I, you know, I call it a vitality deficit. It's when we we just are stuck existing and surviving. And that comes out of the fact that we weren't able to access some of the things that infuse us and replenish that energy and sense of spiritual health, like you said, mental health, emotional health, physical health, because we need things, we need connection, we need movement, but we also need the opportunity to explore and live a full life. And we need downtime where we choose how to put that downtime, quarantine and lockdowns. We're like the ultimate downtime, but without any autonomy. And so when you take those elements away, we do not flourish. The challenge has become, I think that as we come out of that, 
we have shifted the direction of how we're trying to manage our energy. And, and what I mean by that is, I've been putting it this way, the antidote to languishing is not to learn to languish less. It's to learn to flourish more. And I say that because I think often when we feel overwhelmed or we feel tired, we think we need to keep stepping back to feel less of those. When in fact, what the research shows and what I kept finding over and over again for people who kind of lived with this sense of aliveness is that it wasn't necessarily to slow down. It was to stop and change directions and re-engage in different things. Now, sometimes that meant going in solitude and resting, but sometimes that meant accelerating and trying new things in a totally different direction. And so I, I think that becomes a really valuable way for us to be thinking about how we're kind of managing this energy piece. It's not about being less tired. It's about feeling more alive. Yeah. And that, I think, is a very different benchmark. Oh, absolutely. I could hear myself. I could hear so many other people say those words when I read it in the books. Like, well, I just want to feel less tired. I yep, want to absolutely. feel less stressed. We're realizing, oh, you know what? Like you're just talking about just getting just to the neutral point and, and, and you're not flourishing and you don't have that, what you call that vitality. And yes. you talk about having a vitality deficit. Yeah. So what can we do to raise our vitality? So vitality is the easiest way to describe it. Like it's, it doesn't have, it, there's nothing sexy about this word. It doesn't rhyme with anything good. Like it's one of those that, you know, people are like, is there another word? And I was like, well, yes, it's a sense of aliveness. But if you really actually look at it, it's this, this, it's an element of thriving. Vitality is our feeling of being alive. It's, it's the energy of life. Now, with that being said, how we increase that is when we, have our mental, emotional, physical energy directed towards things that matter to us in a way that is healthy to us. So we start thinking about that, like what, is, so if your goal is just to be less stressed, hey, when you're in survival zone and you just want to kind of get through the day and not feel so exhausted, that makes sense. But if that's along the path, of you feeling differently. But what we do when we're like, I just feel so tired. I just want to crash. I don't want to be around anyone. Rarely does that actually refuel us in a productive way. It just makes us feel less tired. And so this vitality piece is recognizing what do we actually want? How do we put our energy towards that in a way that's healthy for us? And that means not only healthy physically healthy, but mentally and emotionally healthy, spiritually fulfilling, um, and recognizing that all energy, non-negotiably, has to be replenished in order to be sustained. It sounds like it's okay to go through peaks and valleys where you don't have to feel uh, 100% full vitality all the time. You can't. In fact, that is... Oh, I get I get excited about this <laughs> also because I think people are like, well, if I don't feel alive and excited for life, then I don't have that. That vitality can be those positive, strong emotions. But it's also it's that, like think about those moments when you do feel most like you, like when you feel most grounded, you feel most capable, you feel most connected to what actually matters. There can be a calm peacefulness quiet determinism in those moments. And so it doesn't have to be big and loud, but it is in the direction of something valuable and in service of what matters. That's an, a really important piece. But you cannot feel it all the time. In fact, I, I said already that it's when your energy is directed towards things that matter to you. So if you're going to do things that matter to you, you are going to face stress. Life has its own adversities. Sometimes it's a direct result of those that down line, we end up feeling more alive and more committed and more clear on those values. But as energy does, it ebbs and it flows. And that is totally natural. And it's also personal. I mean, it's what makes each of us tick and be at our very best is different for different people. Some people are right fundamentally driven by goals, call them conquerors. Like they love, here's what I'm doing. I'm taking this down. I 
am what I call, I call myself a passionist. I love to undo things. I like to figure out why things work and to look at them. And I just am fascinated by the learning of something. Like that just, when I'm in that mode, I just, I look at the world through this lens of wonder. And then I look at my husband, for example, and my sister, they're both so interesting. I just watch them come alive when they are making things make sense, when they're creating this kind of like beautiful thing. And then some of us feel most alive when we are connected to a really clear mission. And so it can be like combinations of all of these things, but it ebbs and it flows. It's personal. And in order to feel it, we will naturally feel it. It's, a, it's, it's our life energy. With that being said, to sustainably create it, it really does take intentional work. So we know that it's not just circumstances. We need to take really intentional actions uh, on the things that fuel us and refill us and reinvigorate us. Right. Well, that makes sense. And a lot of that to me speaks to making sure that we can find that work or find the aspects of work that relate to those things that help us feel, uh, you know, that feel that flow, feel like we're thriving. Yes. Um, at the same time, I recognize that a lot of times we're going to be in a position or we may have to take on a job or may even be reorganized into a role that we may not like or love that well. So is it still possible to increase our vitality if we're in that kind of role? I love what I get to do a lot of the times. And there is a ton of things in the work that I do that I do not enjoy at all, that I will literally say out loud, why do I choose to do this? Because I have to do all these other pieces. So A, does, do you need to love your work? No. Um, I, I will keep going back to it is when you can direct your energy to the things that matter to you. And so that doesn't mean you have to do your life's purpose work. But how do you want to do that work when you do that work? How do you want to impact people when you do that work? What energy, what impact do you want to bring? How can you align to those, to those values? What can you grow from this, give from this, ground around this? I was at a dinner party years ago, and it was with some very cool people. And I'm very, like, I am genuinely shy at those events. And when people are like, I'm an introvert, but I'm not shy. I, I love the opportunity to share what I do. But that, when I'm around a group of people, I just really am that person who would lock myself in the bathroom if no one else needed to use the bathroom. Like, I just get so oh, wow. overwhelmed. And I was like, okay, this is such a, an amazing opportunity to meet amazing people. Like, so Sarah, direct your energy to what you care about. Yeah. So I'm going to like go in and learn. And somebody said, looks at me and they're like, hi, so what's your purpose? And I almost, I was like literally eating. I remember it. I was <laughs> eating a piece of shrimp and I almost choked on it because I thought it was like, I thought they were saying like, what's your purpose of being here? And I said, excuse me. And they said, what drives you? What's your purpose in life? And I to this day, have no idea what I said. No idea in the world what my answer actually was. Wow. And I think that, that there is this heavy weight that we feel of like, what's our purpose? And, and you know, why are we here? And I think sometimes when you just really step back, that having a North Star is, is so powerful. But I think we overlook what's the type of person we want to be with the people we care the most about. What's the impact we want to make here? What's the ripple effect we want to have? And I don't, I've met amazing people who would not say they are doing their life's work, but they are doing it in a way that changes the lives of, of the people around them because of what they bring to that. And I think we overlook that and we're waiting for this perfect, passionate job and we're missing the opportunity to bring our best selves in those moments. Like to oh, say, well, what's, what can I connect to from a mission perspective here? What, what's a small goal I can make? Like, I don't love doing admin thing. I hate working on when my accountant every month is like, Sarah, you must look at these things. I'm like, so then I like make dreams of it. And I, I'm like, how can I do this fast? And, and so what are the things that, you know, we can do to enjoy those moments in a different, in a different way? Or what can I just 
figure out and find the passion in these moments. Like that possibility mindset is available to any of us. You don't have to have like the fact that you're here is purposeful. The fact that you have strengths and impacts on people like that, that is it. So how do you want people thinking about you when they think about you? Like, yes. Decide that. What if somebody was talk, sitting in a circle talking and your name came up, what do you hope they say? And then when you go into that next day of work, how do you bring that forth to create environments where that's the experience people have of you? That is a very meaningful life of mattering and purposefulness from my perspective. And it, it also teases out in the data uh, around people who feel more alive. Um, that is that sense of, of meaningfulness is a lens they work through. That's it. That, that is it. And there, there's a couple of layers in there. So one is if you're in a role, if you're doing the things that you really love, but recognizing that there's a good percentage of that role where you just hate that kind of work, the admin, like for, for me, and it sounds like for you, the admin stuff, yeah. the, the finance stuff, the invoices, yes. the contracts, all those things. I had a leader that helped me reframe those activities maybe a handful of years ago and helped me recognize that, okay, these are the things that I need to do, or these are things that I get to do that, that, that help bring about the big work that I love being able to do. Right. At the same time, there may be a role where like, I just don't, I don't love this role. This isn't what I call like my dream job role, yep. but taking a step back and saying, okay, not looking at the work and the task and the activity itself, but how do I want people to feel yep. after I've interacted with them? And so based on that definition, how can I just inject that? How can I instill that into whatever work I do? And if I can piggyback on that, because I think that's yes. so beautifully put. Sometimes it is, I did a job that showed me so clearly what I never want to do again. Like, and, and, but, but that, was, isn't it beautiful to sometimes be able to say like, I can do this and I thought I wanted this but I actually feel totally drained doing it. So imagine you walk into any environment and I know there's data out of the Mayo Clinic that's like demonstrating and Marcus Buckingham's work around love at work and strengths, but it's like, you know, 10, 15% of the time is good. But if you were to really walk in and hear, uh, I will steal from Adam Grant, but it's this yeah. idea of a possibility kind of experiment or mindset. If you were to walk into something, then it's like, I do not want to be here. So I'm going to walk in like an experimenter. And I am going to figure out exactly what fuels me and exactly what drains me. And so there you go. You end the day with some information. You end the day with knowing what are the types of conversations you want to have and the ones you do not want to have. And that can help you make other decisions because most of the time that that is agency creating, like that gives you a sense of ownership and and that in itself is energy infusing. But then now you can say, okay, what are the things that I'm actually looking for? What are the questions I need to ask in my next role? Um, I just spoke with somebody yesterday and it turns out they're really not thriving by being their own boss. They're really wow. not. They actually thrive wow. in the structure with, with, with other people. And it's like, so what made you believe? that you wanted to do this on your own. Okay, well, now let's take the next three months because you've got this kind of exit plan you've got to put into place and get really clear on, on what infused you when you were around people and what drained you when you were apart so that you go back into an environment that is healthier for you, that you can give your very best. But, but we, we don't know until we try. We also just need to keep an open mindset to learn from things so that we move forward in a productive way. I, I just watch too many people who get caught in what they hate and they miss all the learning. They get just overwhelmed in the frustration. And I'm not saying you have to be positive about it. You can genuinely hate 100% of what you do, but be really clear on, on what that is, why that matters, what values are out of alignment so that you can get much clearer on where you go, what you do next. Yeah. And then, and then recognizing that you've got that empowerment, you've got that agency. 
at least enough agency to recognize and to experiment and to learn from what you're doing so that you can yeah. take those learnings onto the next thing. And sometimes it's not the work. Sometimes it's loving the work or doing the work or working in an environment that burns people out. And that can be confused as uh, of not enjoying what you do. Just it, it sometimes means you just don't have the energy to do any of it. So I just add that in because I think, but then sometimes people are like, I'm burnt out. And I was like, I'm not sure you're burnt out. I think you are not enjoying what you are doing. Like if a weekend is going to make you feel better, you are not burnt out, but, but you have a bigger question to answer. But right. if you take that weekend and you cannot get yourself up out of bed, well, then that's a different conversation as well. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times when we look at our careers, and I think a lot of people have a misguided view of not looking so much at the type of work that helps them thrive and what they like to do. They look at uh, success and then higher and higher levels of success. But you talk about in a few different ways how that view on success can actually trap us. So can you explain that to me? Uh, because I fall in all of these all of the time. <laughs> this was a, a me search research book oh. in so many ways. But again, I, it was interesting. So I call them success traps because they are approaches and beliefs we have about success that have likely served us in the past but are now driving us into survival zone consistently. And the thing about our success traps is they are based on values that, that matter. And, and in my work of writing this book, hearing different people's stories, there was kind of like four big success approaches that consistently people had. And it was like, well, what's the, why are some people... No, like thriving through those and then some people just feeling stuck and plateauing by those and and the four of them I can just give it really simply is this belief that if I love my work then you know the consequences of overwork don't apply to me like if I love my work and I find that passionate work then that's enough number one number two the belief that like to be of service to be helpful to be available to have the open door policy if you're a leader to to drop anything and selflessly help people, help the client, help the customer. Already, you're hearing like this value of, of passion. You're hearing this value of service. Um, the belief for those that are super driven that if I can drive harder, I can do more, right? I, you, you can work eight hours. If I can work 16, no, I'm going to get 16 hours worth of work out, out of this. And, oh, I literally do this all the time. I can catch myself in this trap sometimes. So the, it's the most frustrating one because it's the one that catches me. And then the last one I think is having really high standards, like wanting to do yeah. great things and having those high standards. But where those can start to trap us is when they become, they become extreme. And one of the biggest things is, is because it's not just the belief. There's emotions that influence our beliefs. And there are, I'll pull them out as, as four now because it's the easiest way I talk right. about three of the big ones, a sense of fear, a sense of obligation, and a sense of guilt. And the, all emotions, I will state this a million times, there is no bad emotions. Our reactions to emotions are what get us in trouble. Okay. So an emotion is a piece of information that's trying to get our attention. But when we are driven by fear, by an, a sense of over over responsibility and obligation or a sense of guilt. But the third one is a sense of validation in the sense of, well, this makes me feel good. Like I feel and yes, I don't have to look at my email at 10 o'clock, but I'm the person who does answer an email at 10 o'clock because I am that committed, right? I, I, I'm that person who I have high standards, but nothing less than perfection is okay. Those, the belief that if I love what I do, that's enough. And then all of a sudden, what I do becomes who I am. And so when these emotions start to manipulate the way we look at a, around success, it's what gets us in trouble. And what's the traps around those are because many of the, like many of us who have big goals know that hard work has helped us get there. And so even if it's the end of the day and, and it's like, I know, I know 
I should end my day. I know that if I get more sleep, if I don't cancel out on those plans with friends that I've canceled out on twice, I know that that will be refueling to me. But this overarching feel of like, but if I could just get a little bit more done, if I can just move the needle a little bit farther, like those are the things that that has worked for you in the past, most likely. It's just, it's usually short term and it usually leaves you further from your goals and deeper in survival mode versus closer to your goals and more aligned with what matters most to you. And then a lot of times I think it's just thinking to ourselves that sometimes we'll think, yes, I know that I should do this. I should get enough rest. I should take that time with my friends. But a lot of us, I think, will say, well, you know what? I'm the kind of person who doesn't need that. I don't need that kind of rest. Like I I can get by and I can still thrive on five or four hours of sleep or I don't have to spend that time with my friends and they're going to understand because they know that work is important to me. Yeah, Work can be important to you and being committed to your work is one thing. Being consumed by your work is another. I I will say that over and over again, because what happens when work is everything, if that mattered, then there would not be the volumes and volumes of super insanely successful people that are like, oh, I'm telling you, success is not enough. Like, it's not like there isn't a million stories about this. I don't have to duplicate any of these. But it's also stepping back to recognize, again, what do you, what do you want your life to be? Like, what do you yeah. want for your work? What do you want for your relationships? Because what I see a lot of people is work is really important to me. But at some point, that's success when you reach various, you know, milestones and there's no one there necessarily cheering you on. I have seen some very, very successful people be left very, very hollow and heartbroken when they have no one to celebrate that with. Oh, wow. Yeah. We talk about work-life balance and whatever words you want to use, but, but I always talk about so many of us are caught in this cycle of underliving. So yes, our work matters, but how we live, how we experience things, our relationships with people, those are the pieces that, I mean, again, there's beautiful books written about it. I love Dan Pink's um, book around regret. Yeah. I think everybody should read it. Uh, go for big things, but also remember that when we, I mean, uh, every study on psychological well-being is, shows us that our relationships matter more than anything else out there. So how do we recognize that we can love what we do? It just, and if you love what you do, and if you are determined to do it really successfully, then it can't be the only thing that fulfills you because you were only one component of it. Pandemics happen. Uh, recessions happen, like things happen that will get in the way of your success, no matter how hard you try. So if you want to protect this love of work, then you have to diversify into other environments that any single financial person will tell you diversify your portfolio for a reason. And it turns out that the more we live and the more deeply we love, the more we look at success differently and work differently. And we're creating those environments that, that then raises the collective potential of people around us, demonstrating to them that those things matter. I mean, we're in a place right now where stress and burnout are at record highs, being reported at extreme levels. And so we know that just work is not enough. I just don't want us to go from which means no work, because we also know that when people don't feel like they are meaningfully putting their energy into something, um, that leads to levels of loneliness and depression and different things that way as well. Like It's okay for things to matter. It just can't be, or it can't be the only thing that matters. It seems to me like placing the right amount of focus in work and placing the right amount of focus in those other life areas helps you to stay fueled in the other life areas. So if you're placing the right amount of focus in work, it helps you to stay, uh, to have the right amount of fuel in your relationships. 
if you're placing the right amount of uh, focus in your relationships, helps you to stay fueled in your work. Yeah, which is, I mean, that's it. So just we should all go do that. Yeah. So why don't we do that? Like that's the just problem. Balance it like, out. What's right? Like, so what is the the right amount? And this is where I contemplated when I wrote the book that the last section is around energy and refueling. Yeah. And and I also know that when you look at the stats on how people read books, that so many people don't get to the end. And like, I just keep running around being like, can you please read the last chapter? So so why didn't I put the, the last chapter first if it's such an important chapter? Because it's that like, oh, yes. And by the way, when you're done everything else, you should manage your energy. That is not why it was there. It It's there because too often our beliefs about success and how we manage stress make rest feel impossible, make it feel like we don't have enough time. So actually resting well is one part of the skill. Having a mindset that rest is important is the second part of that skill, right? Like we have this work ethic. It turns out we also need to have a really defined rest ethic. And we just look, we do not take a very strategic approach to how we refuel ourselves. Like we, th there is no core, like even around happiness and different things that like we take full courses around how to create these things. But very rarely does someone sit down unless they are an athlete in general who there is focused on performance. Very few of us learn how to refuel effectively. And we assume right. once a pocket of time opens up that we'll just stop and do what needs to be done. But we have to be as strategic and as intentional at living fully and resting fully as we do about working well and succeeding effectively. Uh, I always say to people, one of the strategies I, I share, especially for those who are very driven, you might have come across it in the book. As I said, most of us have big, long to-do lists. Like I literally have one right on my computer, <laughs> right? List of things I need to get done far longer than why, like that I could get done today. Of course. Um, but do you have a to live list, like a list of things that make you feel alive, a list of things that that can be small moments that reground you in what's really important, the things that you want to do, because we have to also be thoughtful and planful about what we are going to do outside of work, especially if work is some like we won't just stop it. Usually we stop it because we're frustrated, we're tired. Or someone's mad at us. Like for many people who do what they do, right? Like it's like, those are the three things. It, and we're like, yes, I've got to exercise. I've got to do these things. But we often don't actually give ourselves the permission with the clarity of what we're going to do outside of that. And I think both of those are skill sets and areas of focus that, that are completely undervalued. When it comes to these refueling activities, whether it's rest, exercise, or whatever else it is that helps refuel you, which, you know, rest should be a non-negotiable re regardless. Um, yep. uh, a lot of times, I think we look at them either as rewards. Yeah. Okay. Once I accomplish yeah. everything on my to-do list for today, then I can rest. Yeah. Or, 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 or we look at it as when I have time, then I'll be able to do that. Yeah. But I, I love how you talk about, it's about giving yourself permission, giving yes. yourself permission to do that and also reframing it in your mind to where this is something that you are, that you should incorporate and should instill into your day, no matter what. And that's yeah. going to help you thrive across everything else. Well, and that's it. We increase our work vitality quotient when our energy is directed to things that matter to us in a way that's healthy to us. So how do we make rest matter to us, yeah. right? If we can tie it to what's the value to that, our brain is driven through meaning. It's driven through mattering and stories. So we actually have to make the choice and put that information into our brain of why this actually matters to us. And that I think is such a huge piece. You also, if you were going on a road trip and all of a sudden there was a big detour and you had to detour around and and then it started snowing and, and you had to focus really hard. And, yeah. and it was like, oh, my gosh, the gas gas gauge is getting really low. You wouldn't be like, 
Well, as long as we drive for another three hours, then we have earned the right to stop at the gas station. Because that's, that's not how it works. Insane. And yet we do that with ourselves. And we do that with ourselves, A, because we don't even realize the influence of fatigue. We are actually very bad at recognizing that our fatigue is making us less effective. It's making us less kind. It's making us less strategic. Number one, that is a, a huge piece of it. We don't realize it and we don't put the same level of value on it. Like, like you just said, like those two things really get in the way. It, it is a non-negotiable piece. And there is, there's no trophies given at the end of life for enjoying it the least. Oh, wow. So to just struggle and work and never feel worthy and to hurt the people around you who deserve the very best of you, it doesn't make a lot of sense when we slow down and step back and take perspective. But sometimes the only way to slow down and get that perspective is to actually stop. And so there's the... Like, what matters to you? What kind of life do you want? What kind of relationships do you want? What kind of contribution do you want to make when you go into the work that you do? And there is no way to do any of those without energy. But we can do those running on fumes for a very long time. And I think that's the unfortunate beauty of our system is because we can do things from a place of exhaustion for a long time. We start to believe that it's because we push ourselves to a state of exhaustion that we are achieving those things. Yeah. But being excellent and awesome at what you do and being exhausted, those, those two are not mutually exclusive. So you can also do excellent, amazing things and not be burnt out by it. But we have to, we have to decide that's important to test and do. Yeah. And, and to still be able to focus on those, um, you know, one, one of the things you talk about as it relates to refueling, uh, still focus on all those connections that we have and yes. making sure that those connections uh, are important to us. And I think also that those connections feel like they are important. Um, yeah. You talked about how there's no reward for, uh, I, I, oh, forgive me. I, 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 if I butcher this, for not enjoying life. <laughs> yeah, for 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 not enjoying life. I think there is a reward at the end of our life with what we do with our connections and how we treat our connections and how people feel around us. Now we may not see that at the end of yeah. our life, um, but to me, it's it's like what are the eulogies that you want yeah. people to say about you when you are gone? What do you want people to say about you? at your funeral. And yeah. that's through making sure that those connections are important. There is, I couldn't agree more. And though I would always choose to have my mom here, uh, she passed away from breast cancer in 2016. And I will always still say um, when she, she went into remission and then her cancer came back in just with such an aggressiveness and they told us we had like weeks with her and we were very lucky because we ended up having 10 months with her and people will always, I mean, it was the hardest 10 months of my life. And it was also the best 10 months of my life. Like it, because there was this genuine focus on things. And, um, one of the, beautiful things that my family had the opportunity to have. Uh, my mom spent the end of her life in a hospice and they were just beautiful. And in the kind of world of, of end of life care, there is this kind of idea that any conversations around loss are really a conversation about life. Yeah. And I think that you know, people feel that it's a little bit morbid to think that way, but I think there's something beautiful around that. It, it's how do you want to live your life? What is going to make you live life in a way that you feel alive through part of it? And that 
that is a beautiful way to think. And when we think that way, then we think about how do we create environments for other people to have that as well. And that we, you know, I just, that stepping back and having that perspective around what really does matter. We, our brain's not designed to do that when we're overwhelmed and busy. Our brain right. is, gets designed in short term, over focus on task, under focus on relationships. And so I, you know, I know I'm at the top of our time uh, and people, because it's getting close to, to kind of March break when we initially had this conversation, there's always a lot of conversation around right now about people taking vacations and what's the point, yeah. it's just too much work. And I don't know when and how exactly we started taking vacations because of work, like be, to make us better at work. I'm not sure when this connection of like take a vacation and work will get better because they are two totally unrelated things. Like right. a vacation doesn't change work. It changes you, but it doesn't change work. And a vacation taking a step back is where we have the opportunity to spend time with people that we love, to do things and to explore the world and to create memories. And that, that contributes to that conversation about how we live life. So it, it needs to include those pieces. And we just will not realize how much we need that sometimes until we step back. Like We've all had that moment where you take a week, you're busy, busy, maybe you take a weekend off and you have to, like you've got a, maybe a significant other who is like, you said you would not work and you're like, okay, yeah. I'm not allowed to work. I'm not allowed. This has never happened to me. Get before. off the phone. Um, and then you take it off. And then right after you're like, I didn't know how much I needed that. Or you're tired and you say you talk to people all the time and you're in front of screens and you just don't want to talk to another person. And then you're at a dinner with people and you walk away and you feel fueled with a sense of aliveness and energy that you forgot was even possible. Right. And it's because you went out and engaged in the world. And we don't always realize how low the benchmark has gotten of what feeling good feels like yeah. until we step away. And that, I mean, that's that we started the conversation that way. You're going to ebb and flow. You're going to get super busy sometimes. It's can you start to recognize when that crisis moment becomes a crisis method of working and step back and reset to focus on the things that are really important. And sometimes it's going to be heads down, work through. Well, then how do you also make sure you do that in a way that is as healthy as possible and then plan for the time to step back and do it when you need and honor those relationships. And I think if we can just at least start to keep this idea that there is no perfect way to fix people to always be awesome, but we can be much more aware and we can be much more intentional and we can be much more in touch with ourselves and our relationships. And when we do that, we really are amazingly loving, intelligent people. We just need to give ourselves the space to do it. That's, I think, the hardest part. It is. It is. And when that happens, I think it does give us energy. It also gives us clarity. It gives us clarity. Around, oh, here's where I am right now. Here's, here's, here's where I've been lately. Yep. And now I understand the need for maybe a, adjusting this approach here at work or adjusting this approach with my, with my people. It's, and I will, I said that was my last thing and I will add one more yep. on. Uh, the yep. more tired we get, the less open to feedback we are. And so I will just add this one piece Ooh. to say, sometimes that stepping back is, is it gives you that energy to be able to hear feedback from other people. And often the people around us who deserve the best of us, who sometimes get the leftover us, uh, have some very good insights on where we're getting in our own way. One of my red flags that I need a break is when I get super defensive when the people I love are trying to be helpful. And to me, that's always one of those of like, ah. Oh, my brain is in comfort mode and comfort mode to me is pushing through. And there's people I love saying, I think you need to step back. So uh, it also gives us just a little bit of space to hear from the people who really do have our backs because we're not always fantastic at recognizing what we genuinely need. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the people that we're connected to, whether it's our yeah. significant others, our families, our friends, those close coworkers. 
that can yep. help us to step back and reframe how we approach and get to yep. that vitality that we need. That's it. Well, you nailed Sarah, it. <laughs> I, I have loved this conversation. Um, I've got one more question for hey. you. If you were to create a five song soundtrack for Dear Work, what songs would you include? Uh, so anybody who knows me knows will smile at this first song because I have a I I I just get a swagger with Tom Petty. And so Ooh, I'll say the yeah. first one, if I think about it in around this work that I'm doing in the book, uh, Tom Petty won't back down. I think there's that that human spirit of kind of resilience and adaptability and moving forward. Um, Foo Fighters, best of yeah. you. Who's getting it? Because often the people who deserve it aren't, including us, including yeah. us. Um, you too, beautiful day. Oh. And I think oh. that one, because sometimes we just, our brain is designed to pay attention to the negatives it's designed to pay attention to to what is easy and gratifying but that if we slow down and and look and savor those moments and pay attention to the things that make us feel fueled that make us feel loved uh it, it's amazing it's there we just need to look for it so the lens of a beautiful day um it would be we didn't talk about it here but it, it really it can't be on uh queen under pressure because yes. let's be honest there is a lot of pressure and a lot of stress which this whole, everything we talked about is so important but it's really hard to do in those environments so we have to learn how to manage that pressure and then the last one is going to seem a little bit bizarre perhaps and maybe you will remember this because i it was about i think it was around 1985 that this was recorded and it impacted me then and it has been something that I watch all the time because I love it. Um, it was the compilation of We Are the World. Do you oh, remember that? Yes. Um, uh, we, I know. We, we have that on vinyl right yeah, over here. Right? You, you have to. Um, but even now, for anybody wow. listening, like, you can go onto YouTube and you can watch it. And I, I, not to, I mean, that was a, a fundraiser that was fundamentally raising money um, for famine in Africa, right. and, and I am not making a comparison. What I think is beautiful about We Are the World is if work doesn't change unless we change. And when we commit to these changes, when we recognize that we need to work in new ways and healthy ways, then together we collectively change work. And we cannot make these changes unless we start to work together, not just at work, but in life and different perspectives and different avenues of life and different ways of doing things isn't always easy, uh, but it is what makes us move in a way that cares for our people in a way that I think we sometimes lose sight of. And so the collective measure of um, We Are the World is song number five. That's that's fantastic. Um, I love that. And, and I'm just going through all those lyrics in my head right now thinking, oh, that's right. You know what? There is a choice we're making. It is the choices that we make. And that's it. Um, that just gave me goosebumps when you said it. And yeah. People go yeah. go on YouTube, go watch it. It really is quite fantastic. Yeah. And we can make it a better day. We can make it a beautiful yeah. day, even. We can. Yeah. I love that. I love that soundtrack. Thank you so much for for playing along. Well, absolutely. Sarah, I have learned so much from you. I've learned so much from our talk today and from your book. But where can people go to learn more? Absolutely. Uh, my website, sarahross.com. It's Sarah without an H, S-A-R-A-R-O-S-S. -S. Uh, and then you can find me. I do a lot of sharing of information and research and different things I'm doing on LinkedIn. You can find me on yes. LinkedIn, uh, Instagram at Sarah underscore J underscore Ross. And we started a newsletter called the Dear Work Letter. And it is a monthly letter where um. we pull this information together. And it turns out lots of people are starting to write their own letters to work and having their own questions. So it's a forum to help answer some of those and create a collective wisdom of people and what they are doing. So you can join me there as well. Love that. And lo love that idea, that practice, that exercise of writing your own letter to work. Yeah. Too. Excellent. Well, Sarah, I am so grateful for our time today. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Sarah Ross. So go and learn more from her at sarahross.com. 
And while you're there, be sure and take her digital burnout assessment to find out how your relationship to your screens are helping or hindering your vitality and what you can do to improve it. And I highly recommend you checking out Sarah's newsletter, The Dear Work Letter. It only comes out monthly, so you know it's not going to clutter up your inbox. You can sign up for her newsletter directly at her homepage at sarahross.com. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it so much simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Mark Miller. Mark's held a 45-year career with Chick-fil-A, where he currently serves as its VP of High Performance Leadership. Beyond that, Mark works with leaders all over the world to help them build their own high-performance cultures. And Mark's the author of 11 best-selling books, including his latest Wall Street Journal bestseller, Culture Rules, the leader's guide to creating the ultimate competitive advantage. Now, when it comes to creating and leading a high-performance team, it turns out that it comes down to following three simple rules. Mark and I discuss those rules and what you can do to instill them in your own team. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Mark's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple.